I'm not going to give you new information. I'm not going to talk about brand new protocols, and I'm not going to fill your head with more things than that you could possibly absorb at this point. What I am going to do is to help you change cancer. So if everybody could put your pencils and pens down, close your eyes, and think of someone in your life who has crossed you the wrong way. Somebody who has upset you and a situation that lurks on your shoulders. It lurks in the back of your mind. Somebody who you could give forgiveness to. In your mind, picture this person and forgive them. Bless and release the situation. And now forgive yourself for holding on to any negative emotions that have clung to that situation or that person. And then I want you to take a deep breath, open your eyes. And before I go any further, I need to know who I'm speaking to here. So if you could all just stand up for me. So I need to know who you are. I am love. Say it. I am love. I am health. I am health. I am change. I am change. Now from the center of your core, from the depths of your soul, and with all of your heart, I want you to say, I am hope for cancer. I am hope for cancer. Thank you. I needed to hear that because there's, you can sit down, thank you. There are some crazy statistics that drive me crazy. And these are the statistics of chronic disease in particular that we're talking about. So here in the US, these numbers point to one in three people diagnosed with diabetes. Two thirds of the population is clinically labeled as either overweight or obese. Currently, as we stand, heart disease is the number one killer in the United States with cancer coming right behind it, owning one in four deaths in this country. But shockingly enough, we're in 2000, we're in the, we just hit the third month of 2018. According to what statistics show with the constant increase in diagnoses, by 2020, which is just in two short years, one in 2.4 Americans are expected to be diagnosed with cancer. That's nearly half of the population, and these are new diagnoses. So the reason that statistics irk me, and I'm sure you, is because being aware doesn't mean we're being active about it. We have a lot of awareness going on. But awareness is not the same thing as prevention. Sometimes we get so much information we kind of freeze and we forget to take action. And then we just hope that becoming one of these statistics is not us. But it's happening. So knowledge without taking action is merely waiting and hoping and crossing our fingers that this does not become our diagnosis. So the main problem is 5 to 18 percent of all cancer diagnoses are genetic. So let's round that number up and let's say 25 percent. Let's just give it 20, full 25 percent and say that's what our genes gave us. That leaves 75% of all cancer diagnosis being a lifestyle disorder. That's a pretty big number. So much so that that's pretty much put us in the midst 
right smack dab in the midst of a health crisis. Society has trained us to believe and to understand and to utilize the health care system as our sick care management system, not a preventative or a creating our own paths to health. That's not what the doctors are working with us here for. Another statistic is that 75% of all health care costs are attributed to these preventable diseases. We're spending 75%, three quarters of all of the money in the healthcare system is being spent on these diseases that are otherwise considered a lifestyle disease. All of those diseases that we could have taken action, but we weren't necessarily given the right steps to take action on. How can this happen though? We have so many opportunities to work towards prevention. We have all our workplaces, many, many workplaces offer um, different options in the cafeteria. They do lunch walks. They do um, uh, presentations. We have documentaries. We have docu-series. We have workshops. We have conferences. We have conventions. We walk. We run. We race for all of this information. How could we possibly be at almost nearly half of the population being diagnosed with cancer? There's so much information that we sometimes forget to take daily action. It's failure to implement the information that, we, that we're given. So say prevention is not in your cards and you've already been diagnosed with cancer. Now we've put, remember, we've walked, we've run, we've raced for the cure. We've got all of this money in research and development for these cures that we're, we're putting our hard-earned money into, where are they when we need them? Once you've already been diagnosed with cancer, what do you do? Has your conventional oncologist, did they say to you, where did this come from? How did you get this? Did they talk about your nutrition, your supplementation, your genetics, your epigenetics? They ask you, okay, give us the family history. What did your mom have? What did your dad have? What do your grandparents have? But are they asking you, what does your gut have? How do you sleep? Do you exercise? When was the last time you exercised and what kind do you do? Amongst all of the other opportunities to ask those types of questions, has a conventional oncologist ever asked about your emotions? Or how do you feel about this? No. We're in information overload. And with all of this information that we get, sometimes we find ourselves with what I call analysis paralysis. We've analyzed books, we've analyzed conferences, we've taken notes, and then we freeze. We don't know what's the next step. Plenty of speakers have already said, we aren't healthy when we go to bed and wake up the next day with cancer. It doesn't work that way. It's years upon years and decisions and choices upon each other that bring us to this state. We all have cancer. Whether you've been diagnosed with it or not, it's a natural process. It's, it's a very natural process that occurs in everybody. So I had a lecture from an instructor one time and he called it cancer, the enemy within. And he went on about this lecture and as he was describing all of the ways that contribute to to getting to that point of a cancer diagnosis, he was describing inflammation, stress, a faulted circadian rhythm, epigenetics, nutrition. He was talking about all of the choices that we have control over. So in my mind, I'm thinking, cancer, if we consider cancer as the enemy within, you're contributing to all of these, the fight against cancer, the war against cancer, creating this negative connection to this disease that has become inside of, our, inside of ourselves. Leaning towards a negative feeling with something in your body that we need to nurture and find where the breaks in our immune system came from, where the faults in our mitochondria lie, to create that negative connotation was another fault I saw, and it took everything in me to not say, excuse me, perhaps it should be titled Cancer, Are We Our Own Worst Enemy? Of the 
puzzle. Who, who here has a cancer diagnosis? Okay. What's your name? Yep. Mary. What is your diagnosis? So is it brain? Okay, so say you went to the doctor and the doctor said, Mary, you have this bump on your sinuses and we need to get to the bottom of where this bump came from. We've got to look at your inflammation markers. We've got to talk about your lifestyle. Let's look at your nutrition. We're probably going to have to make some changes there. We're going to talk about your feelings and your emotions. We're going to look at some testing that you might not have heard about before. And then there's going to be a lot of therapies that we're going to introduce. They're going to help support your body. They're going to bring balance to your system. And they're going to work at reversing this disease. But instead, the medical model says, Mary, you have cancer. And this is our prognosis for you. This is our recipe. This is our prognosis. Let's get at it right now. Two totally different ways to go, up, to go about giving a cancer diagnosis. And what we've done is let the conventional medical model give us that cancer diagnosis lead us into conventional chemotherapy, radiation, surgery immediately because they don't want to give you any time to wait. And that's what has become the accepted way to treat cancer. Until now, actually until the last few recent years, actually it has been, become more and more of an accepted way. Um, People have been reversing their cancer and healing their cancer for decades, for hundreds of years, thousands of years, with al what we call now as alternative. It's only been the last hundred or so years that we've let conventional step in with nitrogen mustard-based, petroleum-based chemicals and stick those in our body and not do anything to help us with the side effects. So we want options and we want to change. We want the cancer conversation to change. And because of all of you, not because of the medical model system, because of each and every one of you in this room who wants options, who want to change cancer, who want hope, it is changing. This guy right here was diagnosed with stage three lung cancer. Immediately the doctor said, Chemotherapy, radiation, we would offer you surgery, but we don't think you're going to make it, but we'll do it if you want us to. Options, up, the options on the table. So before he told his family, he dove right into chemo and radiation because that's what he was told to do. He was raised that if you're diagnosed with cancer, you remove it or you kill it. You kill it and you kill it hard and you take the most toxic, potent substances that you can and you get rid of it. So he let his family help him with integrative therapies and he did great. Actually no side effects, he felt good, he had a great family connection, um, he medically retired until almost four years later he was diagnosed with a secondary cancer, acute myeloid leukemia therapy related. So guess what the doctors prescribed? More chemo. At this point, he was, his immune system was crushed. He was in the hospital. He took more chemo. Um, however, I will add that he had many family members that he had had falling out with siblings over the course of decades come in the hospital to visit him. They told stories. They reminisced, they laughed. There was more healing that happened in that hospital room from failed relationships of the past <laughs> through his diagnosis until his time of death where he died six months later from respiratory distress syndrome. So his autopsy reported 
that there was no evidence of the lung cancer. So the doctors patted themselves on the back and said, success, no lung cancer. But my dad was dead. So this girl right here was also diagnosed with cancer. No conventional testing, no chemotherapy, no radiation. She's taking control. She's going in Dr. Nasha's, she's using all of the, um, the drops in the bucket like Dr. Nasha refers to. And she's not letting anybody stop her in changing cancer. Because there are options for cancer. We've been practicing for years these options, actually thousands of them. And now, because of the pharmaceutical industries, we refer to these new, these alternative ways as alternative. But they're actually thousands of years old. You can't patent them, most of them, you can't patent them if they're a natural substance. So doctors don't want to take them into consideration, but they have been proven through evidence-based so very promising. So the difference here is that we need to find our tribe. We need our support system. You've got all of this information. What do you do with it? What do you do when you go home with all of these notes? Who do you contact? Where's the right center to go to? Who's the right doctor to work with? Do they have a waiting list? Can you get in to see them? So there's a lot of different people that we've met. Some of them refer to themselves as a cancer coach, a cancer consultant, a navigator, a guide, somebody. Find somebody to be part of your team. There is not one doctor that is right for you. You need a team. You need to be the captain and you need to have a team. You need to have an, a, a natural doctor who supports you in your decisions. You need to have a coach, somebody who's going to work on your adjusting your nutrition protocols, your supplementation protocols for you individually, not for a generalized protocol. You need to call upon somebody who can help guide you to change your path and lead you to a path of wellness. Ultimately, my goal is to help people not only end what we've labeled as the war on cancer, but to, to end this internal war that we've created, that we've accepted. Don't let it be this war that's such a negative word that we need to banish from our, our paths at this point. End the war on cancer. The only way to make change is to be the change. If there's someone you can reach out to, if there's somebody you can, that can support you to be on your team, you need to let them be. You need to accept them. You need to work with them. And you need to work with people that empower you. This is how we are going to change the war on cancer. This is how we change cancer. Each and every one of you have the power to heal, you have the power to change cancer, and you have the ability and you are worthy of healing. Find the right tribe, get your team together, and get to action.